I am so blessed to be at a church that really loves me and loves people. And my, my shepherds, my church shepherds, are those kind of guys, and they continually remind me how much they love me and encourage me. A couple examples, Oscar last week called me out of the blue just to let me know he loves me and how much he supports me and appreciates uh, the messages that I've been bringing. Gary almost always sends me a text or calls me after Sunday's sermon and lets me know that he enjoyed it and he appreciates the work I do. Mac is one of our best encouragers and he sent me a text this week that just says thank you for your leadership and your concerns for the church and I appreciate your efforts to bring people closer to Jesus. Uh, it's just so nice. He, he said, I love you, and I, I think, I'm thankful to God for you. It's so nice to be around so many people who are so encouraging and have such an outward affection for one another. Isn't that nice? I've, I've been at other churches where I don't really experience the depth and the breadth of that love and affection, uh, and it's not ex maybe it's just not expressed as much. This week I also got two seemingly random messages, for, and they were blasts from the past. A lot of you know David Parkerson. I got permission for him to share this with you. But randomly, he sent me a photo of the two of us and sent me a text. David was our first youth minister at Cordova Community Church. I wasn't at Cordova at the time. I was at a different church. But we were both single, and we were both at different churches back in 98, 99, 2000, around those, that time. And so we bonded quickly. We went to youth conferences together. We love to go backpacking together. We were workout buddies at the gym, and we shared uh, accountability with each other. We pushed each other. We prayed for each other. It was a very special bond, and still is today, even though he lives, he and his family live in, in Jackson, uh, Tennessee. But here's the text he sent me to this week. Been thinking of you the last few days after running into the pulleys at Costco, wondering how you guys are doing. Then I came across this picture in an old desk I'm cleaning out. Thanks for being such a great friend back in the day and getting me through crap. Those are his words, not mine. <laughs> and then, and it's so good to hear from David. I love David, I love his family. But just a reminder that, you know, our bonds are there even when we're separated uh, by an hour away. And then I got a Facebook message from a young lady who was one of my students when I taught choir at Gallatin High School back in the 80s. And I haven't heard from her since graduation, basically. And here's what she said on a Facebook Messenger uh, direct message. Oh my goodness, I came across your name on Facebook. I was in the performers, that's the uh, kind of the show choir at our school. I was in performers at GHS in the late 80s. I've recently started watching Glee on Netflix, thanks to Corona. And every single episode, I think of you. I loved every single moment of performers and can't thank you enough for providing me with, with wonderful lifelong memories. It's so good to see you in this virtual world. world. Blessings, and she signs her name. And that was totally unexpected. But, man, can you imagine what all these notes this week and last week have done to me? They have encouraged me so much. See, my love language, one of my love languages is... Uh, words of affirmation. So when people give me words of affirmation and encouragement, man, it pumps me up. It gets me going. Of course, my wife Liz says, tells people, don't don't tell him too much like that because you'll puff him up. Well, I don't want to be puffed up. I want to be pumped up so I can keep going, have energy and drive to keep going. No matter how bad the coronavirus is around us and everything else that's going on, these things encourage me and build me up. And God is so good to me to place me in a community of faith that where people are not ashamed and not afraid to express their love for each other and their affection and to give thanks for, his, for one another. There's nothing better for the bonds of Christian fellowship than this sharing, this... Um, encouraging, especially when the world is seemingly falling apart all around us. Well, last week we started a new study on the New Testament book of Philippians. And Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, which is in Macedonia. Uh, we would know it today more as Southern Europe or in Northern Greece, just across the sea 
from Turkey. And we talked about how the church began. And it began with some women who were down by the river praying on the Sabbath day when Paul and his team, Silas and Paul and Luke and Timothy all showed up. And before you know it, Lydia and her household believe in Jesus and they're baptized. And then Paul, you know, exercises this demon from this young girl and shows the, the miracle of the, the power of God. And then they're thrown in jail and there's an earthquake and the jailer wants to believe in Jesus now. So Paul teaches the, the jailer and his household and they're all baptized. They all are saved in the name of Jesus. It's just a great, awesome story we find in the in book of Acts chapter 16. And so we kind of looked at a 10,000 foot view overview of the letter with some big themes. We looked at a theme of unity, but also with holiness that there, Paul holds holiness and unity together when sometimes they're very hard to hold together. He, throughout the letter, he talks about joy and suffering. He talks about salvation and how it's by grace, but it's also accompanied by works of obedience. And a big idea in his letter is this idea of fellowship or partnership in the gospel of Christ. And there's a lot of other big themes that he uh, he's going to cover in this in this message. One of the things we notice is that the phrases in Christ or in the Lord, these phrases occur 19 times in this, in this short letter of four chapters. I did the math. That's 104 verses. So Paul uses the, these two phrase, one of these two phrases every, about every fifth verse. So in the Lord and in Christ is throughout this letter. That should tell us something. Paul's trying to let us know, hey, there's a, there's a main theme here. There's a main idea. And so we're going to call this study In Christ. That's the title of it. And here's a glimpse of some of those in Christ or in the Lord phrases that we see in, uh, the, in this letter. He writes the letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And he says, we have reason to glory in Christ Jesus. And we can have encouragement in Christ. And we can have the mind of Christ. It is ours in Christ Jesus. And we can worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. And there's a righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. And we press onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we can have the peace of God that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we have we can tap into the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And we are to greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And we can have confidence in the Lord. And we can hope in the Lord. And we can trust in the Lord. We can receive Him in the Lord. We can receive people in the Lord with joy. And we can rejoice in the Lord. We can stand firm in the Lord. We, we can agree together in the Lord. Again, we can rejoice in the Lord always. And we can rejoice greatly in the Lord. This theme of in Christ and in the Lord is all throughout this little book. And if we get nothing else out of the study, I think that's the main idea that we want to capture here. Is that in Christ, there are some very special blessings that you and I have as believers, as followers of Jesus. So today we are going to go ahead and dig into this book and we're going to look at the first 11 verses in chapter 1 and this is Paul's salutation and kind of his introduction to the whole letter but he also gives us a prayer that he prays for the Philippian church. Overall we're going to see in this whole book, there's this challenge that in Christ, in the Lord Jesus, Paul challenges the Philippians to think differently and to act differently than the world around them. To see all of life through the eyes of Jesus because they are in Christ. So now they have a different mindset. They have a different purpose. They're in Christ. So we're going to, he challenges us to think and act differently challenges the Philippians and the Philippians and he challenges us 
to think and act differently than the world around us. So let's read verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay, so we're going to take these verses apart verse by verse. In verses 1 and 2, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. That's how he introduces himself. He's a servant, and he calls the Philippians saints to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And this right now sets the, it sets the mood. It's, in this introduction, Paul's going to bring up several themes that he's going to elaborate on throughout the book, and this is one of them. This is the idea of submission and humility, that in Christ we are slaves of Jesus, and we are saints in Christ Jesus. We're both. And Paul is setting the tone here. He says, I'm a slave. I submit. And the Philippians, you are saints. You are the holy ones. Now, the word servants that Paul and Timothy uh, describe themselves as is really the word slave, doulos. It, it really means slave. And it carries the same idea as a slave, a total submission to your owner, total submission to your master, Lord, and King Jesus. And the word saints is hagios, which, which means holy ones or most holy things. And this recalls back in the Old Testament, when Yahweh made his covenant with Israel, he called them a holy nation. And in Leviticus, he said in several thing, places throughout the New, Old Testament, he expects Israel to live up to their new identity. They are holy, therefore they, they should live out a holy life. And it reminds us how Yahweh called Israel to be holy because what, what, what he says in Leviticus, God says, be holy because I am holy. So they are saints in Christ. Christ is the one who has made them holy. They didn't make holy themselves. They didn't become holy themselves. Christ made them holy. Christ is the one who calls them. He calls them holy and he calls them to live holy lives, pure and blameless. And we'll see this uh, unpacked throughout the letter. And Paul will talk more about this expectation, but right off the bat, he establishes the importance of humility. And he sets the example of how we should place others above ourselves. He doesn't include his, apost uh, his title of apostle like he does in some of the other letters. His, he doesn't mention his, his apostolic authority like he does in some of the other letters. He is a slave and they are saints. And we're going to explore this a little bit more, especially in chapter 2 of Philippians. So in verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. These are some of Paul's favorite words in his introduction to his letters and in his benediction. Grace is the free, unmerited favor of God. Nothing that we deserve can do to deserve this favor from God. It's freely given. And peace, this is not the absence of turmoil and chaos, which we wish it was sometimes, but this peace carries the Jewish idea of shalom. And this shalom is the idea of total harmony and tranquility, wholeness and well-being. It means the salvation of the total person 
It means a reconciliation to God of the whole person, physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. So grace and peace means that the Old Testament dream for the future is being fulfilled right now by God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ, this future dream of shalom. So grace and peace to you, he says. Now let's move on to the next section, verses 3 through 8, where Paul is going to express uh, very emotionally uh, great affection and thankfulness for the partnership that he has with the Philippian church. So verses 3 and 4 say, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. So we'll pause right there. So here, Paul is expressing some really deep, thick, enthusiastic uh, love. He, he kind of goes overboard here when you compare it to some of his other letters. And this can be seen in, in verses 3 and 4, how emphatic he is when he uses what's the Greek word uh, root for the word all. He uses it four times here in this one sentence. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. He's pretty emphatic here, and he kind of goes overboard to get the point across that he is praying for everybody, and it, it's, uh, it's all-encompassing. He's very emphatic here. And he says, I pray with joy. And this is a theme. This is a big theme in, in Philippians. Uh, joy and rejoicing. He mentions this, these words 14 times in this little letter. And we'll talk about that more as we go, on, go through the letter. But in, in contrast to some of the other churches that he writes to, like Corinth or Galatia, the Philippian church has given Paul great joy and he rejoices. And then this idea about prayer. Paul wasn't just praying for the Philippians. They were dedicated to praying for Paul too, as we'll see again later in chapter 1, verse 19. And there's this mutual understanding and a mutual affection, love between Paul and the church, which prompts each one of them to plead to God, to pray for each other that their needs will be met and that God will be glorified. So it's a mutual affection and it's a mutual prayer is how it plays out. We're going to move on, starting verse 5. He's going to talk about a new idea that is also played out throughout the whole book, and that's the idea of the partnership. And in verse 5, actually I'll start in verse 3 because it's one sentence, and we'll go through verse 5. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And this... This word is used again uh, in verse 7 of chapter 1, where it says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, and for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This word that here is translated in verse 5 as partnership, and verse 7 as partakers with me. Uh, it's the same root word, and it comes up, three more times in this letter. Sometimes it's translated as partnership uh, or fellowship, but the cog cognates of this Greek word can also, also be used as uh, sharing or being partakers. These are all the same idea. And the Greek word here, a lot of Christians know this word, is koinonia. Uh, it may be the only Greek word that a lot of Christians know, koinonia. And it's used five times in this letter. So it's a big thing for Paul. And what is this koinonia, this partnership, or this fellowship? Well, today, you know, fellowship is a church word. But back then, it was a common Greek word used outside of the church world in the first century. And it was the normal word for business partnership in which those involved would share in the doing the work on the one hand, and on the other hand, they would share in the financial responsibilities. It, is, it was a business partnership. It was later that this word developed particular meanings in the Christian circles, including you know, this delight of sharing 
in worship together, in sharing in prayer together, mutual support and friendship. This is what we know as fellowship today. Well, sometimes today we even go a little bit more shallow and uh, fellowship is fried chicken at a potluck dinner after church or coffee in the foyer before worship service begins. But it has a much deeper word uh, for us uh, and for the church and for Paul in the New Testament. So it's this deep fellowship, this partnering together, this sharing in the work, sharing in the financial responsibilities, sharing in just Christian life together and mutual support. And this partnership, this koinonia, is probably the main reason for Paul's joy. It's one of the main reasons he's writing this letter because he's so thankful for the koinonia, for the the joy, the affection, the thankfulness that Paul has for the partnership with the Philippian church. And it's a very practical, even financial fellowship with the Philippian church because they've always been active partners with Paul in sharing the ministry from the first day until the present day. And the partnership has been constant through all circumstances. When he's in prison, when he's preaching, when he's defending before government officials, the Philippian church has stood by him and supported him. And they're partners in the gospel. They're partners in grace. And you know what? They're partners in the gospel business. They're business partners when it comes to gospel, when it comes to grace. And they've proven this all along because they've been constant in their financial support. And they've sent Paphroditus, one of their members, to Paul when he was in prison to help meet his needs. And they have they gave to the when Paul took up money for the Jerusalem Relief Fund from all the churches, they were one of the churches who gave, not out of their riches, but out of their poverty. They gave, and they gave, and so they're partners with Paul. Look at verse 6. Paul here talks about confidence, right? He, he says in verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This good work that God began, that God's going to carry through. He, what God begins, God finishes. This good work is, I think, two things. I think it's the initial salvation uh, plus the ongoing sanctification. That's one thing. It's a good work when God saves you. It is by grace that God saves us. It's a, it is God working to save us, and it is God working who carries us through and continues to uh, sanctify us. That is God working behind the scenes. So that's that's one thing that this good work that God has started. I think the other thing is the good work of the koinonia, the partnering uh, with Paul in promoting the gospel. From the very beginning, they partnered with Paul financially, in prayer, uh, in encouraging and sending Epaphroditus. And Paul says, it's my, I'm confident that what God started God is going to finish. And it reminds us, again, it comes back in chapter 2, verse 13, when he says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God works in them. Uh, at the beginning, when they're saved, he continues to work in them and through them for his good pleasure. It is God doing the work. And this is something that Paul is confident in. He's not confident in the Philippians and their ability. He's confident in God, that God is going to carry through what he started. Verse 6 also mentions the day of Jesus Christ. And this is another theme that Paul brings up throughout the letter. He says it again in verse 10 of this chapter. He says it in verse 16 of chapter 2. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord. This, this is the day when Christ is expected to return to earth, when he appears in all of his glory for the whole earth to see. And this idea is translated from, is adapted from the Old Testament day of the Lord. In the prophets and the Psalms, we see this phrase, the day of Yahweh, when Yahweh will vindicate his righteous cause. He's going to put down all injustice, and first and foremost, among his people, he's going to vindicate himself, and evil will be punished. This is the idea of the day of the Lord. And, and for Paul, for the, 
example, the Philippians, for all the Christians, the day of Christ, or the day of Jesus Christ, it is still the day of vindication, when all things will be put right, when all wrongs will be made right. It's the day of final judgment, when lives and actions of Christians will be reviewed and assessed. And it is the day of salvation, right? Even though Christians are already saved, on the day of Christ, on the day of the Lord, is when salvation which has already begun, is going to be fully realized, fully consummated, fully completed. And in this letter in Philippians, Paul encourages the Philippian Christians to be ready for that day. How? By continuing to live holy lives. And he is confident, not in their abilities, he's confident that God who began this work is going to, in the beginning, on that first day, is going to carry it through and empower them to live these holy lives until he returns on the day of Jesus Christ. Now, verses 7 and 8, Paul really, again, expresses his great love with, with intense emotion. It's kind of out of character for Paul to be this emotional. You don't see that in some of his other letters. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. You know, there's a phrase that has a lot of truth to it. They say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. I think there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of us have experienced that. But there's another phrase that also is true, and that is this, out of sight, out of mind. And when people are removed from us, either by miles or by time, it's easy to forget those people and not think of them. But Paul keeps the Philippians in his mind, so the absence does make the heart grow fonder. And it's it, in this phrase, there's a phrase here that says, because I hold you in my heart, in verse 7, there's actually a lot of disagreement among Greek scholars about that phrase, because the way the Greek is worded, the way it's constructed, it could either mean, I hold you in my heart, Paul holds the Philippians in his heart, or it could mean, you hold me in your heart. In other words, you Philippians hold me, Paul, in your heart. That's how the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, translates it. But I think that both really are accurate and appropriate that it's a mutual affection that both Paul is holding them close in his heart and that they are holding Paul in their heart and this is the reason for Paul to feel such affection and such love and such thankfulness for their partnership in verse 8 he says I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus I mean, this is Paul being very emotive. He says, I love you. I ache for you at the deepest level in my gut, in my stomach, in my heart. And that's the word affection has to do with, in the Greek idea of the gut, the stomach, the liver, the heart. That's where the intense feelings are felt. And you felt that way before about somebody butterflies in your stomach not just butterflies because you're nervous but that gut-wrenching ache yearning because you love somebody so much and you miss them paul feels this same intense love for them and he longs to be with them he yearns to be with them so paul's love for the philippians and the philippians love for paul have grown in their absence both time and distance but this is only because, and primarily because, I should say, because the communication that has continued back and forth and the prayers that have continued back and forth between Paul in prison and the Philippian church. I mean, they sent one of the members, Epaphroditus, down to Paul in prison to take care of his needs. They sent money to Paul to take care of his needs in prison. Remember, in first century prison, they didn't feed you. They didn't give you anything. Uh, you had to depend on outsiders to take care of you. Paul and the Philippians have just continued to really pray for one another and to keep their communica communication lines open because they purposefully 
want to keep each other in their hearts. So this has strengthened the bond of affection between them. Now let's look at uh, verses 9 through 11. And here we get the actual contents of Paul's prayer. What's he, what's he actually praying about? And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So in verse 9, Paul talks about a smart love, a wise love. He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Now, Paul has already expressed an intense emotional affection, a love that he feels in his gut for the Philippians. It's a deep, heavy, intense love. And it's unusual for Paul to use this kind of language when in his letters. But the love he feels and the love they feel for him is not just a strong emotion. It's not puppy love that a teenager feels, this dumb love and blind love. That it's not just all heart, it's heart and head. It is emotion and affection mixed with knowledge and wisdom. And they're bound up together. And this is how Christian love for one another is supposed to be. It's not one-sided, all mind or all heart. It is heart and mind together. It is emotion and intellect. It is that gut feeling plus wisdom and discernment and so this is the kind of uh, love that paul has for his people and really the kind of love he wants them to have for him too and this smart love doesn't exist by itself on an island it is for the purpose of moral discernment he says i want you to have this kind of love that grows and grows in knowledge and discernment in verse 10 he says so that here's the purpose you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So in verse 10, he prays that this wise love, this, this smart love will result in the ability to, to discern what is right and what is wrong. And they lived in the world, in that Greco-Roman world, with all these different gods that are worshipped and there's no real standard. And the Jewish monotheism of the world was a, was a strange thing to the Greco-Roman world. And now these Christians are saying that Jesus, who was a man, is actually God himself. It's, these are strange ideas. To reject all the idols and all the other gods in favor of one was strange. And there's a lot of pressure on the Philippians to conform to, to, the, to the culture around them. And it's easy for moral issues and financial issues and business dealings with your people around you for those things to get blurred and distorted. Where is the right? Where is the wrong? Uh, the, the gray areas need a lot of discernment. In an, our day, in a day of moral relativism, in our postmodern thinking, this doesn't help us at all. I'll tell you another thing that doesn't help us discern right and from wrong are how, is how deeply politically divided we are. I mean, that doesn't help the situation. You know, sometimes the wider the political divide, the more entrenched we become in our political party's ideology, right? Which means we're blinded to the possibility that the other side might have something valuable to add to the conversation. And we argue and our emotions take over our minds and we lose the ability to discern what is best because we're so emotionally tied to the subject and we're too busy arguing with each other and and being entrenched in our views that we shut our minds off and confusion abounds in this crazy world we live in and sometimes what we thought was right we see is called wrong by the culture around us and we see what we think should be called wrong is encouraged and extolled and even flaunted in the culture around us. And white and black issues seem to become shades of gray. Paul longs for their love to grow in wisdom and knowledge and discernment so they can readily tell the difference between good and evil. And they can readily discern what is best, especially when they live in a culture with shades of gray everywhere. This way... They can approach the day of Christ 
with confidence because this is evidence they're growing love as it grows in knowledge and wisdom and discernment this is evidence that god is transforming how they think to be more in line with jesus not with the culture around them one of the biggest challenges paul faces with the philippians is to think differently than the culture around them and when they do this evidence that god is transforming their lives into a holiness and and a righteousness and their christ comes back he will find them pure and blameless he goes on to say in verse 11 he wants them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through jesus christ to the glory of god so this, this is his last part of his prayer here. And he says, I want you to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Or more literally, I want you to be filled to overflowing with the fruit of right living. That's how N.T. Wright translates it in his uh, New Testament translation. This describes what a pure and blameless life looks like. He said, I want you to live pure and blameless. Here's what it looks like. Your life is filled with overflowing with fruit of the Spirit, fruit of right living. And it, it recalls what he said also in Galatians chapter 5 when he lists some of the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's a lot of debate over this word righteousness in theological circles. Is it the righteousness that God imputes to us. In other words, it's God's righteousness given to us. We have no righteousness on our own and no ability to be righteous. Or is it righteousness that God imparts to us? In other words, he gives us the ability. He empowers us to live righteous life. In my opinion, the answer is yes. That God imputes his righteousness to us. Because without Christ, there's nothing righteous in me. It is Christ, it is His faithfulness from the very beginning at every stage of the process. From the first day until now, it is Christ working in us. It is righteousness that is imputed to us. But also, we have some responsibility. And through the power of the Spirit, we do have the power to choose wisely. Why else would He pray for our love to grow with wisdom and discernment so that we can appear blameless and pure in the day of the Lord, right? It's both. It's both and. Righteousness or right living is a gift of God. It's imputed to us, and it is by the power of Christ that we can live a righteous life. But he gives us, through the Holy Spirit, the ability to choose wisely if our love continues to grow in discernment and wisdom uh, as we grow closer and closer to Christ then our fruits of the Spirit will overflow, and these will be fruits of righteousness. Now, everything that involves our holiness and our righteousness is, and is from Christ. He says it comes through Christ. This is how he ends his prayer here. It comes through Christ, and it's to the glory and praise of God. So, as usual, Paul's prayer for the church is a prayer that every Christian might use for himself or herself, right? We are to pray for the growth of love. A love that grows not just emotionally for one another, but it grows in wisdom and understanding and discernment. We pray for people to make daily decisions that are holy and righteous. We pray for their discernment and their wisdom. We pray that the Spirit will produce an overflowing harvest of spiritual fruit in their lives. And that everything that we've done to the glory and praise of God, we want God to be gloried uh, above all else. And this is a form of koinonia. This is a form of fellowship and partnership. We partner with God and we partner with one another and we join in the good work that Christ began on the first day and continues till now. And we have confidence that he will bring this good work to fruition, to completion on the day of the Lord. Over these last few days, I have received some very sweet messages from people just to say thank you, to say, Barry, I love you. And thank you for helping me through this hard time. Uh, thank you for the influence you've had in my life. Thank you for the work you're doing. How do you think these things made me feel? Man, they pumped me up. They encouraged me. They got me going, right? They inspired me. And they prompted me to reach out to some others and do the same thing. So this week, 
uh, I tried to contact one of my old mentors, and his name is Julius Hovam. He was at the Gallatin Church when I was first hired into ministry. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have any Bible training or ministry training. I came from teaching school straight into full-time ministry as youth minister and worship leader. And Julius, in a lot of ways, was a veteran, and he took me under his wing. He taught me a lot. But I lost track of him. He moved away from Gallatin up to Kentucky. But I heard that he moved back to Gallatin recently. So I called the Gallatin Church Secretary. I said, I want to get a hold of Brother Hovan, Julius Hovan. Do you have his information? Well, she gave me his phone number and his his uh, mailing address. So this week I'm writing a letter to Brother Hovan. And he's 81, I think, years old now. And uh, I'm going to express my love. I'm going to express my thanks to him and my, my deep affection for him, for the influence he had on my life. Uh, and I want to encourage you guys to do the same thing. I want you to show your affection. This is your assignment this week, okay? You have two assignments. Number one, I want you to show your affection. Express your thanksgiving, your love, your joy uh, with a brother or sister in Christ, right? Don't let the current circumstances be an excuse because you're separated. And it may be that you are separated by miles and miles and miles and by a long time, it's someone you need to go back into your ancient history and say, oh, I, I need to write to them. Or it could be someone in our church, someone that you have regular contact with that you want to express your love to, your deep affection, your, your thankfulness and your joy for this brother or sister. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. None of us, as far as I know, are in prison right now. We may feel like we're in prison because we're in lockdown, but for goodness sake, let's don't let our circumstances get in the way of expressing how we our love for our brothers and sisters. And so that's your assignment this week. Your second assignment is to pray for people. And if you're a part of Cordova Community Church, we are going to send you a list of all of our church partners and our regular church attenders. So you'll have a master list. And I'm asking you to join me in praying for each and every person in our church by name this week and in the coming weeks. And you know their personal situations a lot of times. We talk to God about that. Paul said, I pray for all of you, for every one of you, and all my prayers all the time and every time I pray. So we want to do the same thing. So I'm going to give you a list of people in our church for you to pray for. If you're part of another church, I encourage you to get out to your church directory and systematically, purposefully go through there and pray for every person. We all know how church directories are outdated as soon as they're printed. So maybe you need to call your church secretary and say, hey, can you send me a list of church members so I can be praying for them? So these are your two assignments. You're going to write some notes. You don't have to be written notes. You could call somebody. You could do a text. You could send an email. You could write an old-fashioned letter if you want. But let people know. Go out of your way to tell them how much you love them, how much you're thankful for them. Tell them why you're thankful for them. Tell them about the partnership that you share with them. Remind them of the relationship, the koinonia and fellowship that you have with each other. So you're going you're gonna to contact some, some specific people and do that and maybe even include a prayer in that uh, correspondence. And you're going to pray we're all going to pray for people in our church this week. Those are our two uh, action steps after reading the first 11 verses in Philippians. This is a great book. I told you at the beginning it's one of my favorite books. I hope it's going to become one of your favorite books. Last week I encouraged you to read Philippians, the whole book, several times this week. Challenge remains. Keep reading through this book and meditating on it and asking God to show you new things and how you can imitate uh, some of the things that Paul is teaching us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this example of deep affection, of love, of koinonia, of fellowship, example of prayer, the example of consistency and partnership, all such good examples and so many more things in this, in this book, especially even in these 11 verses. We barely scratched the surface, I feel like. Thank you, God. I pray that 
you will use this book to, to the Philippians to, to get into our hearts and minds and souls and change us, Lord. Make us more and more like Jesus. Help our love to grow and abound in love and understanding and affection and wisdom and discernment so that we can make wise choices and choose what's best so that we can be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. Thank you for all these things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.